Welcome to the Baby Bunting live series. Tonight we are live with Tim Wayne, the director of INPA, Infant and Nursery Products Alliance of Australia. And Tim's here tonight to tell us a bit about INPA and Baby Safety Month in November and how INPA are raising awareness and educating parents and caregivers about creating a safe environment for baby through their new digital magazine, Tribe. Welcome, Tim. Thanks, Jesse, and uh, great to be part of this session with uh, Baby Bunning, who is a principal partner of our program of Baby Safety Month. Oh, our pleasure, Tim. We're really happy to have you on board. Um, at Baby Bunting, as you know, we're really proud to support IMPA and their mission to help parents create a safe environment for their child. So before we delve into the topics in more detail, could you please tell our viewers what IMPA's primary focus in the community is and what Baby Safety Month is and how IMPA's driving this initiative? Okay, thanks. Um, IMPA is an alliance of retailers, suppliers and not-for-profit organisations like Red Nose and KidSafe. And our mission is to improve safety and reduce preventable injuries associated with nursery products. We develop guidelines. We're representatives on standards committees, standards Australia committees, but we also try and improve the awareness about how to use products correctly. Because in recent years, we've been really good at being able to make products safer, but we're still seeing a lot of preventable injuries and we need to reduce those. And the way to do that is to educate people better. So the initiative of Baby Safety Month was designed to raise awareness on, on how to be safe in the community with nursery products, both in your home, but also out and about in the community. Absolutely, and there's certainly um, lots of information out there and available for parents and carers, which can sometimes be a little bit overwhelming, I think you might agree, Tim. So there's so many hazards, um, potential hazards around the home, uh, and the week of Baby Safety Month really focuses on tips to safeguard your home and you know keep your little ones safe. Um, one critical aspect of this initiative is baby safety around the home. So. What areas do IMPA cover on infant safety around the home? And can you give us some details on that, please? Yeah, what we're trying to cover in this Baby Safety Month is we're, we're looking specifically at the nursery environment. So how do you set up a, a safe nursery? And there's a simple message there is keep it simple. Don't overload the, the cot or the crib or the bassinet with other things like toys or, or bumpers or things like that. Keep it simple. A firm flat mattress is the best sleeping environment and it's not required to have anything else in there. So we've got some really good um, articles on our website that talk about that. Uh, we've got some lovely presentations from Red Nose that talk about how to set up a safe nursery. We believe that we've designed cots to be very safe. What we need people to do is use those products correctly. We're also looking about around the house, some obvious things around the house. And with the recent episodes with COVID and lockdowns, we've seen an increase in burns associated with infants. And a lot of the time that's the, that's because parents get busy, they get caught up in their day-to-day -day life, homeschooling, looking after kids, working from home. It's There's lots of distractions around. The result of that has been, they're probably not as aware as they normally should be on looking after the house from a safety perspective. We need parents to understand what the child sees. And, and one of the simplest ways to do that is get on their ground level and crawl around and understand what sort of hazards are exposed in there. We talk about that in our safety awareness uh, for this particular week of home safety. We look, look at pet safety. And surprisingly enough, there's been a big increase in the number of pets that have been introduced in the house. And introducing pets and having pets safely around a, an infant is quite a challenge, but there's a lot of common sense things you can do to reduce the possibility that there'll be dog bites. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened in lockdown and we've seen an increase in dog bites associated with infants. So what we're trying to do is just raise awareness on, on what people need to do. How do they put a safety barrier up around a doorway, around the nursery, so the dog can't get access into into the uh, into the toddler's uh, bedroom. We, we encourage parents to, before they bring a baby home, if it's a first child in particular, is to take the pram out 
regardless of there not being a baby in there, but get used to the dog walking next to a pram because normally that will spook a dog if it's if it's walking next to a pram. It's about using some common sense tips and our website is full of those really good tips that people can use to improve their safety around it. We also talk about bathroom safety and sadly we see kids drowning around the home too often either in swimming pools or in recent cases there was a child drowned in a pet bowl where the pet bowl had some water and the child doesn't need much water to drown in. They are top heavy infants usually and when they're walking around or crawling around and their head gets stuck into something like a bucket or a pet bowl they can so easily drown it only takes a few seconds so we're trying to make people just be constantly aware of how to make their home safe if they're cooking to make sure the cooking utensils are put at the back of the stove so that the child can't get access to them so it's it's a range of those sort of tips but not only that are we looking in baby safety for tips like that but how do you get access to support structures? And we know that the COVID in background has meant that people haven't had the same level of support they would previously have had. Previously, like they would have had their family and friends and everyone would be surrounding them in the hospital enjoying the birth of a baby. That hasn't happened. And we also know that a first time parent suffers a degree of anxiety because they don't know what they don't know. So by giving them access to these services, which we talk about in our Baby Safety Month, we think we can improve the level of uh, awareness around safety. Well, you've covered a lot of um, different topics there, Tim, and it's so important um, to have, you know, in part sharing these messages and, you know, equally important for baby bunting to be, you know, raising awareness of these messages. So I think you touched on, um, you know, water safety just really briefly uh, when you mentioned pets and the dangers around, you know, water bowls and things like that. I was just wondering if you could expand on, you know, water safety and the importance of being vigilant uh, around babies, children and the water. Yeah, I'd be happy to do that because I think People, when they think about water safety, they automatically think of swimming lessons. When do they need to go and have swimming lessons for their toddlers? But they forget the obvious things around the house. Things like the water temperature of your hot water service, making sure that that you don't have a hot water service that's ridiculously hot, that if the child happens to turn the hot water tap on by mistake, and that will happen. We all know that um, we've had experiences and me as a grand, grandfather, understand when I see my granddaughter, she'll go and play with the taps and wash her hands. And she hears the messages about washing hands really important, especially when she's burned the toilet, but then doesn't quite understand about the hot water because um, it's never been really uh, um, said to her how to avoid that. But one of the things you can do as a parent or a grandparent is make sure you turn your temperature down on your hot water unit so that it's not 60 or 70 degrees, it's actually closer to 50. So if they do accidentally turn on the hot water, they're not going to burn themselves. Making sure the plugs are not accessible in the basin so that if if a child, for instance, a toddler in particular gets access to a plug, next thing you know that they can sort of um, fill up a bath themselves or they can fill up a basin and that's when they can be not actively supervised and find themselves in trouble. And I reiterate again, the issue about kids, particularly youngsters are top heavy. Their head is bigger than the rest of their body in comparison. So they will topple over, they will topple forward and they won't be able to get themselves out of those dangerous hazardous situations. So we're saying there are some common sense things you can do around the house. Don't leave buckets of water around, don't leave Um, pet bowls full of water, look at the size of pet bowl that you've got for your water bowl to see if you can get something a little bit smaller and less hazardous. But yeah, we're just trying to encourage people to to be aware at a very early age, not just think it's all about swimming pool safety, not just about being at the beach safety. It's, It's around the house because we do find there are a lot of drownings that occur around the household simply because the act of supervision stops. Yeah, and I think, you know, just a matter of being aware of those different situations, you know, can really help, you know, I'm sure there's, you can put the water 
bowl away perhaps in a place where a toddler or a little one just can't get to it and things mm. like that. So I think it's really important that you've touched on all of those points. Um, I wanted to go back to when you mentioned about pets and safety and, and what can parents and carers do to help keep children and pets happy and safe? The, the best way is to integrate the pet or the baby into the household uh, with a plan. Be prepared, work out what needs to be done. And we have some really good tips on our website where you can do that. There's, there's organisations like We Are Family, which are part of the Victorian Agricultural Department that specialise in this. They go out to childcare centres, they go out to maternal health centres, educating parents on how to avoid incidents with, with pets. But it is about planning for that, making sure that you listen to the behaviour of a dog if it's a dog that you've got, making sure that you, you're um, doing things, like I said, like taking the pram, even without a baby in it, for a walk beside the dog so they get used to it. It becomes a normalised practice. Also, don't assume that just because a dog is friendly and you visit some friends that it's always going to be friendly to that, that uh, new child that you've brought into it, in, to the uh, situation. Most pet bites or most pet injuries are caused from the pets that are owned by the same family or friends of the family. It's very rare that you get a pet bite from or a dog bite from a pet that you don't know. So I guess it's one, the critical thing is be prepared. Think about how the dog's going to be. Use things like safety barriers because you can buy a safety barrier in every, every shot. I mean, that's a number of people that buy a pet barrier, a, sorry, a barrier at a, at a baby bunting store are buying them Correct. a lot of the time to, to avoid pets uh, getting access to areas. It won't always guarantee anything, but the critical thing then is make sure that you get one that's going to fit your doorway and make sure that you get one that's actually secured properly. So read the instructions and be prepared and, and look for the obvious things around the house that you perhaps don't understand. They are as obvious as what they are. It's really fantastic advice, Tim. Thank you for sharing that uh, and those tips on pet safety. Um, we've touched on, you know, a little bit on safety around the home. We've talked about, you know, water safety. We've talked about pet safety. Um, another um, point that we wanted to get your thoughts on today was around, you know, um, preventions with goods purchase, so secondhand goods market and you know, what types of products should parents and caregivers consider buying new instead? Yeah, look, that's a really good question because I suppose one of the big concerns I have is around secondhand car restraints. We, we strongly recommend that parents should never use a car restraint that's secondhand unless that car restraint, you know the history of it. And I mean really understand the history of it because a lot of the times parents will swap car restraints from one car to the other's occasionally they will drop them. If they drop them, it, it goes and may impact on the integrity of the car restraint itself. And that is really difficult to understand sometimes if a, if a car restraint has been damaged. You can't see some of the hairline fractures that occur unless, you, unless you're trained specialists in this area. Unless you know the history of the car restraint, it's unwise to use a secondhand car restraint. The other thing is you should never ever use a car restraint that's older than 10 years. And there are used by dates on car restraints to, to make sure this doesn't happen because the technology changes considerably. Car technology changes on a regular basis. The car restraint standard changes on a regular basis as equally as much so that it keeps pace with the different ways the car seat interacts with the car design itself. So that's a really critical thing. Uh, and I understand people don't always have the money to buy new products, but if you don't buy any other products new, I would encourage people to buy a car restraint new, uh, it, unless you know the history of that car restraint. When it comes to things like prams, prams have a very high wear and tear factor. And it's really critical that if you've got a secondhand pram, that it's actually in good working order, that the brakes in particular work. We've done a lot of work in recent years to get the safety standards right associated with prams because we know how critical those features are. We know the working brake is absolutely essential because the design of the modern pram is designed to be quite manoeuvrable. 
And in, when you increase maneuverability, you increase the capacity for it to roll away at a very quick rate if it's on an uneven surface. And we, we really want people to make sure that they're aware there's a brake on a pram and we want people to use that. There's a tether strap on a pram. They're there for a reason. And sadly, we've, we've had a history of where the, the, these designs originated from. And they originated from the fact that we saw a, a whole lot of situations where prams were rolling off train platforms because the mum would arrive at the station, busy waiting to catch the train, suddenly sort of getting little Johnny or little Mary out in the pram sort of, the next thing you know, she's turned her back to pick up something out of a bag and the prams rolled off onto the, off onto the train line itself. That's why you need to use a pram brake. That's why you need to use a tether strap. And that's critical safety component of it. With prams, the danger of buying a secondhand product or buying a pram that's bought from overseas from an online supplier is that it may not meet the safety requirements of the modern Australian pram. We have very strict standards of safety associated with prams. Those standards are some of the highest in the world. And if you buy online a pram, for, even if it's a new pram, you can't be guaranteed it meets all those safety standards we have in Australia. And if you don't uh, understand also that you may have problems with your warranty with that if it's bought from overseas. So I would say purchasing a pram is a great idea. Everyone has a pram. In fact, we sell probably a million prams in Australia every year and there's only 300,000 births. So if you do the numbers rapidly, the average person has three or four prams in, in, in the lifetime of that baby. And the reason for that is they undergo a significant amount of wear and tear. They get thrown into the boot, they get sort of knocked around, they get dropped on the ground. Um, and that always plays into the safety. Eventually, if you've got a pram that's, that's not in its true working order and parts wear out because of this wear and tear, you compromise some of the safety aspects. Absolutely. I think those are some really important points. And one other thing I'd probably mention is just back to the pram break. Um, I think all of the uh, prams in Australia have a red break, so they're really prominent and that's part of the safety features and all of our prams at Baby Bunting have a red break. It's part of the Australian safety standards. Yeah, it's, it's a very important part of it as well. And, and Australia is, is one of the few countries in the world that insist on that. And we insist on it for a particular reason is if, if it's not a red break, people forget that there is a break and therefore they yep. don't use it. As soon as they see something that stands out that is red, it triggers off a mindset that says we have a break here, so we should use it. And I, the industry fought very hard in the early part of the 2000s for this to come in. And we did this simply because we needed a, a connection physically and mentally with, with the colour red and using the brake. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm going to go to a different product group now because one of, I think, the most researched products, if it's not prams or car seats, is baby monitors. Um, and there's so much to choose from. So without kind of going into too many details on different types, are you able to tell us from a safety perspective how to keep children safe around them? Uh, keeping safe around baby monitors, the first part I suggestion I would make is buy the the monitor that best suits your needs. There's several types yes. of monitors. There's monitors that are just sound based only. There's monitors with videos. It's quite a confusing space. There's monitors that sit under um, pads that sense movement on the on the cot. Um, it's a really difficult challenge to think. I grew up in an era where you didn't have baby monitors. And, and of course you had your own anxiety as a parent in those days because you thought, um, um, what's going to happen and we're all conscious of SIDS related incidents and things like that. So I think baby monitors go a long way to reducing the uh, ability to um, understand how your baby is sleeping. Babies have interrupted sleep. That's a perfectly normal thing to happen. A baby monitor, particularly if it's got a video screen, is really useful depending on the type of house you live in. If you have a nursery that's at one end of the house and you're up the other end of the house on a regular basis. It's a good convenient way to hear if the child's waking up and to be much more sensitive to that. So you can respond quickly to that. 
if you live in a two-story house, then you need to make sure that the, the baby monitor that you've got is going to have um, communication at both levels of the house. So sometimes you can't guarantee that. The best people to ask about that are people like the like the staff at Baby Bunting, who are yes. highly trained in in understanding the needs of these. And most of the questions I would think when a person goes to visit a Baby Bunting store would be, well, this is the type of house I am in. What type of monitor do I need? And it's not about which is the best brand. It's about what's going to service your best needs depending on your individual circumstances. On our website, we have a really good um, understanding or a good presentation on what to look for in terms of a, a baby monitor. So they're really quick, clear. It's not particularly um, designed to be challenging for people. It's designed to answer all the questions people have before they know what questions to ask. And that's the big challenge we have in baby safety anyway, is the parents don't often know what questions they need to ask. And by having our baby safety month and having it broken up over four weeks with di different focuses on particular themes in the month, we're trying to encourage parents to think about baby safety from an holistic point of view. It's not just about the product. We think the product is pretty safe in Australia now for most nursery products. If you buy a product from a reliable retailer like a baby bunting, where you've got strong compliance programs in, you're members of an industry group like IMPA, where you're across all the, all the hazard information, you're across all the developments in design, then there's a fair chance that the product that's sold will be the correct product and a safe product to use. The next challenge, is how do we use that product in the house correctly? And that's why going to a, a dedicated store like a baby bunting is critical to understand that expertise. And the staff in baby bunting stores are well-trained and I know how well-trained they are because you're considered industry leaders in this space about how, how informative you are, how you take that uh, information and convey it to the parents in the way that they need to be able to use it. And, and why that's so important is you can design the safest product in the world, but if you don't use it correctly, you'll still have injuries. We have designed a cot over the last 20 years. It's essentially a box now. It's a very safe box, but it's designed in such a way that all those hazards that used to kill chicks 20, 30 years ago, like corner posts and protrusions and things like that, and gaps and trapments, they're no longer in the safe nursery product cot that you buy from a from a store that's been um, bought new. They're they're safe now. All those hazards have been designed out of it. But we're not seeing a massive decline in the injury rate because parents are still misusing the product. They're not picking up the cues on when to take their child out of a cot because you get to a stage when a child's around the eighteen months to two and a half years age where they need to move out of a cot and move into a bed. In, and if you don't, they will climb out of a cot. Eventually the child grows tall enough where they will climb out of a cot. The climbing out of a cot and falling out of a cot is made worse if parents put extra things in the cot, such as toys or pillows or bumpers, because they form a ladder. And once mm -hmm. the child uses those, they'll topple out of the cot really quickly. And in, and in recent years, we have, as I said, designed the cots really well to make them really safe, but we need to now get to a stage of educating parents how to use the cots safely. We don't mm -hmm. want children injured in nursery products. No one wants to see that. No one but wants a lot to the, see that. A lot of the time, people don't understand how to make the environment as safe as possible. And through Baby Safety Month, it's about raising that awareness. And we're doing this on an international basis as well. We share information with our colleagues in similar organisations in, in the UK, in Europe and in America who are doing Baby Safety Month and sharing how we can educate parents better. So that, because it's not, it's not unique to Australia, baby safety. It's, it's something we need mm. to tackle on a worldwide basis. And if we can learn from overseas uh, organisations, that helps our Australian babies. Absolutely. Um, lots of really great points there, Tim. And um, yeah, thank you for sharing them. I think there's one other um, topic, you know, before we get to the end of this episode that 
um, we wanted to kind of cover or maybe two topics, but one of those was around driveway safety. Now, unfortunately, you do hear of some really horrible accidents that have happened in the driveway. Um, I just wanted to kind of touch on, on that and see if you can tell us a little bit about, you know, things to remember with, you know, safety in the driveway. Yeah, thanks for that. We, we've partnered with Georgina Josephine Foundation as part of Baby Safety Awareness. And that is a foundation that was set up by parents, Peter and Emma, to really raise awareness about safety around the cars in the household environment. They lost their, their, their daughter, daughter, so their passion in life was to make sure it doesn't happen to anybody else. Unfortunately, as a result of lockdowns and COVID, people now are just so anxious to get out and about, and they're probably not as vigilant as they need to be in terms of roadside safety or to do with uh, car safety around the house. There are some fundamental things that I can advise people to do which will improve safety. And one of the simplest ones is what was is a personal story to me. My daughter heard a lot about the Georgina Foundation and when she was having a new doorway put into her garage, the, the builder who was putting the doorway in brick, breaking through the brick walls and everything was going to put a normal door in there that was normally at a height where you could open it. And she said, no, I'm not gonna do this. I want the doorknob raised much higher so that my daughter, when she grows a bit older and is a toddler and is walking around, won't be able to open the door and get into the garage so that I won't then um, be in a situation of not seeing her if I'm busy rushing to go out somewhere. Um, it's little safety tips, tips like that. Um, most cars, modern cars now have a mirror, have a sort of reversible camera. That helps, but it doesn't take away all responsibility. You still have to check. You still have to separate. And we have a great video on our website from the Georgina Foundation that talks about what you can do around the house to improve safety. And once again, it's, it's exactly what we're trying to raise awareness about in Baby Safety Month is it is a complicated situation with all these hazards around the family, out and about and everything else like that. And you can't do it justice in, in 20 minutes or half an hour's discussion. It's a lifetime of learnings that we've tried to bring together under the one heading to say, here's what people should look at in terms of baby safety month. And of course, you know, um, we'll pop the link to INPAR's website um, so that people viewing tonight can get some more information um, on all the things that you've talked about. Um, so before, before we wrap it up, I think there was a, a couple other things. Dummies or pacifiers and hygiene. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that, please, Tim? I certainly can. Well, it's, it's interesting when you, I'm on the standards committee for dummies. And when we were looking at dummies, we were looking how frequently you need to use a dummy. And most parents will go through about 24 dummies a year. On average, that's how many dummies every, every child uses in a year. That's a lot of dummies every two weeks, that means. So it's a high turnover product. And it's a product that drops on the ground. It's a product that gets lost. And there's every reason why there's such a high number of those. But it's equally really important to use dummies correctly. And it's critical that you follow the hygiene advice. It's a requirement in the standard to provide that hygiene advice and to make sure that you use it. We give some tips on our website about how you can improve hygiene. But it's really essential that if you think a child's dummy just drops on the ground, the potential for that to be sort of um, transferring of um, germs and things like that is pretty high. So we, we want people to be aware that they need to take some responsibility with, with hygiene. One of the other factors about safety with dummies is you have to check it's, that it's in good working order before you put it in the child's mouth. And Children, especially if they've got teeth, will put bite marks eventually if they chew it long enough or, or sometimes if you decide to um, boil up the dummy, which is probably not the best way of hygiene, um, mm -hmm. it, it can cause damage. So I would just implore parents every time they're going to put a dummy in the mouth to at least pull it up and stretch it to make sure that it's in working order and that it's not going to tear and it's not going to cause any problems down. 
And we've re got very strict safety requirements to do with uh, dummies anyway in Australia. So you can be assured that if you buy a, a dummy from a reputable retailer, it's going to meet the safety standards anyway. You don't have to worry about that side of it because other people worry about that for you. The, yeah. the part you can do as a parent is, is make sure that it's clean, make sure it's in working order and it's going to be what you're, it's going to be the soother that you intended it to be. You're in control of that as a parent. Great tips. Um, thank you, Tim. Um, speaking of, you know, choosing products and things, when it comes to choosing the big products that have a manufacturer's warranty um, and using it appropriately and according to the manufacturer's instructions, um, I wanted to just touch on, you know, when you're having a look at safe, choosing a safe product, it's the first step is using it appropriately and according to the manufacturer's instructions is the next second important step. So I think, could you just maybe expand on that a little bit more for me, please? Yeah, look, it's, it's a really critical part of the safety process. Each product is slightly different. So if you buy one pram that's a particular brand, it will vary differently from another brand. And each one is designed about, I mean, if you use the example of a pram, they're designed to carry a certain weight limit a lot of the time. And it's important that those weight limits are, um, are declared on the product so that you know if your child's 15 kilos, that the pram that you're going to buy is going to be suitable for, for carrying a 15 kilo pram. Equally, if you've got a large child that you want to keep in the pram for a bit longer, that you want to make sure that it's going to be fit for purpose. And and that's why it's it's absolutely essential to read the instructions on what it's fit for. Another aspect of prams is is you will have seen in recent years the prevalence of, of car restraints being applied to a pram. And there's a fitting that goes on an accessory that goes on a pram that allows you to be able to fit a car restraint on it. Not every car restraint is designed to fit on that pram. And there are lots of situations where a pram manufacturer doesn't make the car restraint, but is, is actively saying a certain brand of car restraint is suitable for that pram. The only reason they can say that is it's been tested to that. And, and it undergoes an extensive testing regime where uh, the regime looks at stability. It looks if it, if it's going to be um, hitting a bump, is it going to stay on the product? And it's really important not to do uh, in an appropriate uh, mix and match. If you're going to buy a pram and you're going to buy a car restraint, ask the person, does this particular car restraint fit on it? And then make sure that the accessory that comes with it to allow that connection to occur, make sure that's fit for purpose as well. Not everybody has the same connections. And that doesn't mean to say any of them are unsafe. Most of them are safe that I'm aware of. And most of them have been tested, but it's important because there are only a few manufacturers of car restraints in Australia. I think there's probably about three or four, um, but there's probably 30 or 40 different types of prams that you could equally look at and put a car restraint on. So you want to make sure that the connection is the right connection and it's designed for that particular pram. And if you don't follow the instructions, then that's when you have the risk of doing things wrong and the potential for injuries to occur. Yeah, that's a really good point, Tim. I think um, just to kind of build on that, I would say that our team members are super knowledgeable in store um, around adapters and, you know, which adapters are suitable for which brands of car seats or, sorry, for which brands of capsules um, and, you know, the prams that they go with as well. So I think if you're not sure when you're going to purchase a pram or a car seat or a capsule, um, you know, when you visit us in store, by all means, please talk to one of our friendly teamers and they yeah. can give you all the details that you need to know. And I know from personal experience that you've got one of the strongest compliance teams in your business who are excellent at, at making sure that a product actually does what it's supposed to do. They're making sure that it's being, if it says that it's suitable for X, Y, Z car restraint, that they've actually got a test certificate to show that it does. If it says that it can carry a 25 kilo baby or toddler, then it's then they'll have a test result to show that. And and 
knowing that you've got that degree of commitment behind the scenes that people who walk in a store never see or don't need to see, but knowing that that exists out there is is a really good um, feeling to know that that exists. And I, I can say from a personal point of view and an industry-wide level that baby bunting probably are one of the leaders in terms of this compliance space. Comprehensive discussion tonight, Tim. Really great to have you on the live series. We covered lots of points today um, and, you know, there's, like you said before, it's really hard to put a lifetime of experience in a 30-minute episode, but I hope that we've given our viewers tonight a really good overview of Baby Safety Month and Baby Safety in general because it's not just about Baby Safety Month, it's um, about being vigilant always. So it's a really good reminder, um, you know, just to raise awareness on some of these points. So thank you so much for coming on Pleasure. and sharing your knowledge with our viewers tonight. Um, and good night. And thank you, everyone, for joining us on the live series. We'll see you on the next episode. Okay, thanks, Jesse.